Hello? So, can anyone hear me? Mm -hmm. Hello? Hello? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, welcome back, everyone. Um, so, my name is Shishuo Fu from Chongqing University. So, it is my honor to introduce the next speaker, Professor James Fu Wood, or in his uh, Chinese name, Fu Wu De, yeah, which happens to be uh, the same family name as mine. <laughs> I don't know if that, that was a reason why Professor Wu asked me to introduce <laughs> him. <laughs> anyway, uh, so uh, Professor Fu Wood got his PhD from Florida State University, uh, supervised by Professor Alufi. And then he uh, did postdoc fellow at the University of Hong Kong from 2012 to 2017. After that, he joined Shanghai Zhao Tong University as a special researcher. I guess uh, it's a tenure track position. So um, his research interests include algebraic geometry, mathematical physics, categorification, singularities. And today uh, he's going to talk about counting nilpotent operators, which uh, seems quite interesting to me because um, according to the abstract, uh, he will talk about some new proof to some known result, but the new proof is uh, motivated by uh, Julio's uh, famous proof for Katie's formula, which is very uh, enumerative combinatorics. Okay, so without further ado, uh, let's welcome our speaker, Professor Fu, you can take over. Thank you, Professor Fu, for this, uh, that very nice introduction. Uh, perhaps we're related, uh, and we, we don't even know it, so maybe we can look into that. <clears throat> Um, it's my pleasure to be here on uh, 2 Pi Day. Um, it's my first time giving a talk in this type of format, but I don't think it should be much of a stretch from what we usually do. So we've all been doing a lot of these types of meetings for the past six months. <clears throat> okay, so the, the title of my talk is uh, Counting No Potent Operators, and I call it a proof from the book. So uh, the famous mathematician Paul Erdős introduced this idea of this book that the mathematical gods have that contain all the nicest proofs of, of the, the theorems that, that we concern ourselves with as mathematicians. So I think this, this uh, proof to de deserves to have a place in such a book. Okay, so first I will give a, a definition. So uh, let T Uh, be a linear operator on a vector space, finite dimensional vector space X. So all vector spaces in my talk will always be finite dimensional. So I don't have to keep saying this over and over again. And um, <clears throat> if I need to specify that the field is finite or not finite, I will, I will say so. Right. So let T be a linear operator on a finite dimensional vector space X. Um, then T is said to be uh, nilpotent uh, if and only if uh, t to the k is the zero operator. Okay, so this is zero scalar in the underlying field, but the zero operator. Okay, so some uh, non-negative integer k. Uh, greater or equal to zero. <clears throat> All right. So, so the following theorem, which I believe was uh, first proved by Fine and Herstein, I will give a kind of a summary of um, the different proofs of this theorem. But I believe it was uh, first proved by um, Fine and Herstein in 1958. Is that so? If X is a finite dimensional, I said I wasn't going to keep saying it, but for the sake of stating the theorem properly, I will say uh, finite dimensional again. So if X is a finite dimensional, a vector space over a finite field, right, 
so that in particular x um, only has finitely many elements, then uh, the number of neopotents on x uh, divided by the total number of linear operators on x is equal to 1 over the, the cardinality of 1 over the cardinality of x. So in particular, you can think of this result as saying that if we just choose a linear operator on x at random, then the probability that that linear operator is in fact nilpotent is 1 over the cardinality of x. So hopefully that's clear to everybody. <clears throat> So I want to summarize uh, the different proofs of this result. So uh, first, in 1958, by Fine and Herstein, uh, using partitions, then another proof appeared in 1961. Uh, by uh, Gerstenhaber, uh, no partitions, then in 1990, uh, Kaplansky uh, gave a proof using uh, inclusion exclusion. Uh, then in 2006, uh, Crab gave a proof uh, using prefer codes. Then in 2014, uh, Broward, uh, Gao, and Shiki. Uh, gave a proof using a fitting decomposition. And uh, Q binomial coefficients. <clears throat> so I think in this paper, they also mentioned that uh, Philip Hall gave two different proofs in um, lecture notes, I think in the, in the 50s or 60s, probably the 1960s, I forget, I forget the year. Um, one of the proofs using a form of Mobius inversion. What is what? Oh, the partition method? I, I haven't gone through the proof myself, but just you know, using like uh, partitions of sets. So. <clears throat> so in 2019, Leinster gave a proof, which is the proof I'm going to go over today, using only element, uh, elementary linear algebra. Okay. So basically with no computation. So essentially a coordinate free proof of this result. Okay. So now I want to talk about how this this theorem here may be seen as a linear of Cayley's formula for the number of trees, the number of trees uh, on a set with n elements, whose vertex set is a finite set with n elements. So everybody can hear me okay still? So, 
So counting uh, nilpotence as a linearization of Cayley's formula. So I first want to uh, give a definition of what a tree is. <clears throat> so definition, a tree is an undirected uh, acyclic graph. Okay. So for example, <clears throat> This would be a tree. Okay, so there's no cycles in this graph, and so this is would be a tree, and this, for example, would not be a tree. Okay. <clears throat> So Cayley's formula is the following. So let X be an N element set. Okay. Then the number of trees on X is equal to n raised to the n minus 2. Okay, So by trees on x, I mean trees with vertex set being x. Okay, <clears throat> now I want to talk about how eventually, so again, I'm assuming here that X is some uh, N element, some finite set, how eventually constant functions uh, from X to X, okay, are in bijection with rooted trees. Okay. So rooted trees on X are just trees on X uh, with the choice of a distinguished vertex. Okay. So this is canonically isomorphic to um, trees on X cross X. So let's say S, X consists of the following elements. And I have some tree on X. All right. And so a rooted tree is a tree on X with a distinguished vertex. So let's say this is the distinguished vertex of my rooted tree. Right. So now what we can do is given a rooted tree, we can orient all the edges towards its root. Okay, and now such a diagram represents a function on X, which is eventually constant, meaning that, so uh, if we call this vertex, let's say V, the distinguished vertex in our rooted tree, this means that um, F to the K of X equals V, so means there exists a K 
uh, greater than zero such that um, the kth iterate of f of x is equal to v for all x in x. Okay? So this immediately implies that this vertex v is a fixed point of the original function f. And so the way we view this diagram, so for example, if this is x here, then this is f of x. Okay? So if this is, oh, let's say y here, then this element here is f of y. Okay? So the arrows are pointing in the direction of where each element is getting sent by the function f. All right. So again, given a rooted tree, we can associate, it, associate with a rooted tree an eventually constant function on x. OK? Now, since we know eventually constant functions on x are in bijection with rooted trees, on x and rooted trees on x are just trees on x together with the choice of a distinguished vertex. We know that the cardinality of, I'll just write, uh, event, eventually constant functions <clears throat> okay. um, over the cardinality of just functions, of self functions from x to x is what? <clears throat> right? So we know the cardinality of eventually constant functions on x is the same as the cardinality of trees on x times the cardinality of x. Okay? So here we get n to the n minus 1 by Cayley's formula. Right? So we're just multiplying this by the cardinality of x, multiplying both sides of this formula by the cardinality of x, which is n, which yields n to the n minus 1, over n to the n, right? which is 1 over n, or in other words, 1 over the cardinality of x. <clears throat> All right. So now notice this is very similar to our theorem on nilpotents. So the theorem on nilpotents, which I've erased, is if we is that the number of is, or you can think of it as the probability that we take a randomly chosen linear operator on a finite dimensional vector space over a finite field is one over the number of elements in the vector space. <clears throat> okay, so we can sort of view uh, just a finite set X as a vector space over the field with one element, and then the event constant functions would be the analog of neopotent operators in this context. Okay? Or you can view it the other way. I see neopotent operators on a finite dimensional vector space X over a finite field are a linearization of eventually constant functions. Okay. So now I want to give a, a, a quick sketch of Joyal's proof that um, <clears throat> that such a bijection exists. So equivalently, it's a proof of Cayley's formula. Okay. Right, so another way to, to write this here, right, since such a There should be a bijection between eventually constant functions on x cross x to functions on x. Self functions. Okay. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase this eventually constant functions on x by uh, trees on x cross x. cross x. Okay. So we can think of the left hand side as the set of doubly rooted trees. All right. <clears throat> so this proving such a bijection, right, would equivalently prove Cayley's formula as well. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give uh, a sketch of Joyal's proof of the existence of such a bijection. 
Okay. So again, this is just going to be a sketch um, <clears throat> due to time constraints. Right. So I want to start with a doubly rooted tree. So it's a tree with two distinguished vertices. Okay, so before I do so, I should say, so for every subset V of X, okay, choose a bijection. between orderings on V and permutations. Okay, so orderings on V are just bijections between V and um, the set one, two, up to K, where K is the cardinality of V and permutations of V, everybody are just um, bijections from V to itself, right? So, but this is a non-canonical bijection. So for example, what should um, <clears throat> the identity permutation be corresponding to over here? Okay, so it involves, it involves an arbitrary choice. But once you make uh, one choice, what you choose to associate the identity permutation of V with all, all the other um, elements of the bijection are determined from that. Okay, so now let's say I start with something on the left-hand side, a doubly rooted tree. So I have two distinguished vertices Let's say I call this one U, and let's call this one V, okay? So since these are vertices in a tree, right, there's a unique path from U to V, a unique minimal path, right, from U to V. So let's say these are some other vertices, okay? And so, uh, so from these other vertices, we, we may have some other trees hanging off of them. Maybe something like this. Okay. <clears throat> right. So now, since we have a unique path from U to V, we get a distinguished subset V of X, okay, corresponding to these vertices along the path from U to V, right? So let's call this uh, vertex U, let's call it V1, let's call this vertex V2. Let's call this vertex V3. Let's call this vertex V4. And let's call this vertex <coughs> V5. All right. So now what we can do is we can um, erase the edges here. OK. <coughs> and if anyone knows anything about combinatorial species, we can see here that uh, doubly rooted trees, if I call it, let's say trees star star, um, for those that know about combinatorial species are orderings composed with uh, rooted trees. Okay, so here I have now four rooted trees or five rooted trees, okay, and I have a certain ordering on this collection of five rooted trees, right? Okay, so now I've chosen a bijection. I've chosen a bijection between orderings on V for any subset V of X and permutations of V, okay? So now we invoke this arbitrary choice of that bijection. <clears throat> okay, so now we have an ordering of V. Now I'm gonna invoke the bijection to permutation on V, okay? So that's gonna decompose into some cycles. Let's say, something like this. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. No, get like this. And then maybe something like this. Okay. So any permutation of a finite set decomposes into cycles. Okay. So now we can see we have a diagram of a general function on X, right? Any self function, right, has this, has this structure, okay? It has the, the periodic points corresponding to the cycles. And then if we orient the edges like this, okay, this gives us the diagram of where, where the other elements are sent by the function, okay? 
So I think I only have about five, five minutes left. So maybe I will go like five minutes over. Okay, I apologize for doing that. So for Leinster's proof of the theorem on neopotence, I, I want to talk about some elementary um, linear algebra lemmas. Okay, um, I will just state them very quickly because I don't have much time. Right? So background linear algebra, if V is a, a subspace of a vector space, X is subspace W is said to be complementary to V if and only if X is the direct sum of V and W. So in other words, the dimension of V plus the dimension of W adds up to the dimension of X and they intersect only in the zero vector. So lemma one, if U and V are vector, sub, are vector spaces, then there exists a bijection between linear maps from U to V and complements of V and U direct sum. Okay, so given a linear map from U to V, so we can view this schematically like this, we have a graph of that linear map which is a subspace of the direct sum of u plus v, u direct sum v. And conversely, right, given a complement in u plus v, you can view it as the graph of some map, okay? <clears throat> okay so lemma two, if T is a linear operator on X and it's neopotent and we have a vector v in X, then V, T of V, T squared of V up to T K minus one of V are all linearly independent. Okay, where K is, is the <clears throat> smallest positive in integer such that uh, T to the K of V is zero with T to the K minus one V. Well, it's the only integer such that um, T to the K of V equals zero and T to the K minus one of V is not equal to zero. So we can think of this as the index of V. Okay, so the third lemma is that if I have a linear operator on the direct sum of V plus W, all right, and V is invariant, V is an invariant subspace with respect to T, then we can take a basis of V and a basis of W and then write T as a matrix in the following form. Then T is neopotent if and only if these two blocks are neopotent as well. Okay. So the fourth lemma is that for any vector space V, there exists a bijection between automorphisms of V and ordered bases of V. Okay. So this is very similar to uh, this part that I used in Joyal's proof over here. Okay, so there's not a canonical bijection between the two. So, for example, you have to pick which ordered basis of V corresponds to the identity automorphism here. Right? And the fifth lemma is that if I have a linear operator on a vector space X, then there exists complementary subspaces V and W such that Q restricted to V is an automorphism of V and Q restricted to W is neopotent. So there are many ways to show that if you know something about Jordan decomposition, you can get it immediately uh, from there. But it holds, so Jordan comp decomposition requires some extra assumptions about the linear operator, but there's no assumptions needed here. Okay, so now I wanna spin, um, all right, so now I will go to Leinster's proof. <clears throat> Okay, so theorem, let X be a finite dimensional vector space over any field. Okay, so what's interesting is the proof of this bijection doesn't require the field to be finite. And so it works over any field. Okay, so then, there exists a bijection uh, from neopotent operators on X cross X to linear operators on X. Okay, so since I'm running short on time, I won't write a corollary, but by taking cardinalities of both sides of this bijection, uh, we immediately see that the cardinality of linear operators on X for the case of a finite field over the cardinality of um, all the linear operators on X is one over the um, cardinality of X, which is the original theorem I stated. Okay, so let's look at the proof. So for any subspace 
um, v of x, choose a bijection. Okay, so this is very similar to the, the way I started out um, this proof, or maybe I erased, I erased that one. Okay, so for the other one, uh, for any subset of the vertex at x, I chose a bijection between uh, orders on x and permutations on x. Okay? So choose a bijection between ordered bases of v and automorphisms of v. Okay, and also choose a complementary subspace. Okay, which I'll call V perp. Okay, so I'm not invoking any inner products here. So this is just an arbitrary a, an arbitrary choice of a complementary subspace. <clears throat> okay, so I'm not going to write down all the details because I'm I'm pretty much out of time right now. So I'll do kind of more talking. So what am I? What I'm going to do is I start with a new potent operator and a vector in X. Okay. So now what I can do is I can iterate. I can start hitting V with T. So I can hit, and I can do this up to the index of V. Okay. Now, yes? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, I'm just starting with an arbitrary element of this set here, okay? So once given a neopotent operator T and a vector V, I can start hitting V with T, okay? And <clears throat> all of these guys are linearly independent, thus they span or are, are a basis of a subspace V. So associated with this, we get a subspace V of X. And not only this, we consider this an, an ordered basis of that subspace, right? So this also determines an, an automorphisms of X, okay? So my goal here is from this final lemma, from given the input data of a new potent, potent operator and a vector, I want uh, to uniquely associate with this data a vector, a subspace V and an automorphism on V and a subspace W and a neopotent on W, okay? So I, I have the first part of my association already, okay? So now I want to find uh, this subspace, associated subspace W and a neopotent on W, okay? So now one thing to notice here is that V is invariant with respect to T. Okay, so if I consider V perp now, and I consider T restricted to V perp, this gives me a map from V perp to V direct sum V perp. Okay, so in particular, this induces a map from V perp to V and V perp to V perp. So if I take the basis of V and um, V perp, right, I can think of T as a matrix as T V V zero, a T of V perp V, and then T V perp V perp. Okay. Now, since T is neopotent, we know from this lemma here that both of these guys are neopotent. Okay. And now this here is just a linear map from uh, V perp to V. So using this lemma one, okay, linear maps from V perp to V correspond to complements of V and V plus V perp, okay? So, so if we think of, let's say V perp here and V here, Okay, so a linear map from V perp to V 
determines a, a complement to V. Okay, so let's call this W, which we can just think of it as it's the graph of the linear map from V perp to V. Okay, so this determines a complementary subspace. W to V. Okay, <clears throat> so again, we want these two spaces here to be complementary. All right, and so from here, we know that this is a matrix representation of a neopotent map from V perp to V. Okay, but since we've canonically associated with this construction a complementary subspace W to V, oh, that's one thing I left out. Okay, so any two complementary subspaces are canonically isomorphic to each other. So V perp is canonically isomorphic, is canonically isomorphic to W. Okay. So using this canonical isomorphism, this determines uh, a nilpotent on W. Okay, and that's essentially it. Okay? So I haven't given all the details. But I think if you think about it for a while, you can see why, why this association is, is one for one and, and onto and so forth. Okay, sorry for going five minutes over. I'll stop here. <laughs>